everybody, this is Jess from 3D Learning Experts, and you're listening to the LD Experts Podcast, the show for busy parents who want to help their kids with learning disabilities, or as I like to say, learning differences go from surviving to thriving. Hello, everybody. Today, we have the special honor to have Brittany Pierre on our show. And Brittany is a fellow dyslexic, a social media manager, and a writer. And she has written for Oprah and The Village Voice. Brittany and I are both New Yorkers. So that's really (laughs) exciting. I always love to be in the presence of other New Yorkers. So everyone, please welcome Brittany to our show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to have to talk to you today and learn more about how you as a dyslexic turn to a career in writing. (laughs) Who would have thought? (laughs) I'm sure your English teacher in elementary school wouldn't have thought, right? (laughs) I had one teacher who really believed in me, but my counselors did not believe in me, that's for sure. (laughs) So when did you find out that you had dyslexia? How old were you? I think I was like the end of high school, right about right before I was applying to colleges is when like um, they gave me a diagnosis that I had dyslexia, reading comprehension issues. And um, and then I just found out I had ADHD like during COVID. So I was like, oh. Seriously, but it, it made so much sense, you know. So, um, I assume you struggled long before you found out you were dyslexic. Tell yeah. us a bit about that. Yeah, all throughout school was incredibly difficult, and I come from a family of educators, and school was just really easy for them. And so they were, my mom was very confused on like why it was so difficult for me. Like she just thought that I just wasn't studying enough, but really it just wasn't the way my brain could operate the way I was getting information. Um, And so school was super hard. I loved read, like I loved books because I loved the imagination it would give me, but it was so hard for me to read. And it was hard for me to explain that to my mom. And she, and I, Bless her heart. I don't want to say it sound like my mom is a bad person, but she was like, you just don't like reading, you know? You know, she still says that to me. I'm like, no, I just have trouble reading. It was always difficult for me. Um, and but I love to read and um and I just decided I loved reading articles as well of things that I enjoyed. And so I always was like, I want to be a writer. But the idea, and I also wanted to be a radio disc jockey for a little bit. I really loved Wendy Williams. And then I realized like, it's gonna be incredibly hard for me to be a radio disc jockey with um, with dyslexia. I'm just gonna constantly make mistakes. And I don't know if I'm capable of dealing with the wrath of that. Um, but going back to growing up and dealing with dyslexia, um, my mom was very proactive and she did put me in a lot of after school programs that would help me with studying. But I swear to God, if it, it really was difficult. And um, I was told in high school that with my counselor, they were like, you're never going to graduate from a four year school. Like you just aren't capable of doing that. So they always were trying to steer me into like a trade or anything else that wasn't a four year school. And so did you graduate from a four-year university? I did. I graduated from Rutgers University. Oh, my father taught at Rutgers. We have so many parallels. I know. (laughs) And my mother was a teacher as well, although she was dyslexic. I'm assuming your mother was not. No. Was your father? That I don't know. My but my dad and my mom were big avid reader readers, so I don't I don't know. Probably yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although my mom was an avid reader and she has dyslexia. So I mean I guess and I I am an avid reader too yeah. now. So I mean I guess, you know, if we work through these things, we we can not present the way 
we might have as children. Yeah. Well, so, um, so you grew up in New York and tell us a little bit about your educational experiences. Though school was difficult, I do really appreciate growing up in New York City. I just was exposed to so much. I went to a really progressive elementary school and middle school where they taught us about different cultures. And um, we were able to spend a week in Montauk and <laughs> spend a week in the Hamptons for like, you know, so we had nature because New York City kids don't see trees. <laughs> Um, we see trees, we, were, we just don't see grass. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, and I was able to go to museums and I, I discovered that I really just love the arts and taking in history and learning different things. Um, so that was a really great experience for me. And obviously I, I love the arts and I became a writer and I talk about pop culture and music. Um, but yeah, my schooling was great. I loved it, even though it was hard for me. And, um, but it was really a good ex experience for me. So what I'm hearing from you is your mother being an advocate for you, even though she didn't understand yeah. is really the reason why you thrived. Yeah. I think if my mom just gave up on me, who knows where I would have been, where I would have been, um, part, her putting me in like after school programs to help me with my homework and, um, making sure that I go to a four year college because I felt very discouraged. Like I didn't even want to apply to any schools. And um, she did not want me to not go to a four year school. Um, she's like first generation um, American. And she was just like, you have to go to a four year school. Um, and, and going to college was really difficult because you're on your own and you have to survive on your own. It's not like school, like, you know, high school or elementary school where you have teachers like make sure that you hand in your paper, like everything's on your own. And one thing I had to learn was to be my own advocate, figuring out how I study, because I realized the way that I was taught to study is just not going to work for me. And so I had to figure out what I need to do to make sure that I graduated. So that meant I had to go to every, you know, office hours with the professors, make sure that they knew who I was um, and go to any like study sessions and make sure I write all the notes repeatedly so it's ingrained in me. And I think me figuring out how to study and how to in digest what I was learning really helped me to graduate, even though it took me, it took me five years to graduate though, but that was because of math. <laughs> well, that's, that's not bad. Five years is only, you know, one year more than what the average is supposed to be. And I don't even know that. I don't know what the percentage of, of normies that graduate in four years is. Uh, I say that's good. <laughs> I mean, I was told that I was never going to get into a four year school and I ended up getting into Rutgers University. And I was also told I would never graduate from a four year school. And even though it took me five years and a lot of trial and errors, I, I still graduated. Yeah, that's awesome. So how did you get into writing or social media? What happened? What came first? Writing, being a journalist. Um, since I was 12, I met an author who like really made me realize like, oh, people that write books are like regular people and people that you could talk to. And she was telling me all about how she came up with her story. She used to write about her cats and, and created all these different stories about her different cats that she had. And I thought, how cool is that? Like, I want to do that. I didn't want to write books, but I um, enjoyed reading magazines and the newspaper of reading reviews and stuff like that. And I knew I wanted to do something like that. Um, and so I did try radio disc jockey and it was really difficult for me. And, um, but I had a teacher in ninth grade who told me that I had a really interesting way of writing. And she was like, if you keep going at it, I think you can have success with it, which was the opposite of what I was learning from all my teachers who were like, yeah, really terrible grammar. You're not that great at writing. Aww. Um, but she saw something in me that others didn't. And I really, I kept that with me. And um, I started writing professionally while I was in college. Um, I did a lot of internships 
And um, I was a freelance journalist for a while before um, making a career change into social media. And so tell us, where did you, where were you a freelance journalist? I've written like uh, all over. I feel like I've written like over a hundred articles in the last 10 years. Um, I've written for Oprah Daily, The Independent, Digital Spy, Vibe Magazine, um, The Village Voice. It's a long list, uh -huh. but uh, it's, but, and I also wrote about my experience of being a writer and having dyslexia, because I feel like some people just um, don't understand how difficult it is for me. And that like, sometimes when I do make an error on like what I'm writing, it's not because I'm careless. It's literally my brain just doesn't comprehend that. Like I can't see my mistakes, but I, which is interesting because I can see other people's mistakes, but I can't see my own. Well, um, and they say that you should read out loud so that you can catch your own mistakes yeah. because otherwise you see what you meant for it to say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Today I, my assistant just asked me, what do you mean by this? And I put a B instead of a P and I, I typed a B instead of a P. So that made the, my whole request very confusing. <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> so how long have you been a social media manager? So I made a career change um, about three years ago. And um, I had for years, even as I was a journalist, people were like, you're really good at social media. Like you just know how to, you understand trends. You, you know how to capture your ideas in a really quick way that gravity, like people resonate with. Um, and so it took me a while to like listen to them and then be like, okay, maybe I should make a career change and go into um, social media. And I still write on the side, but that is my full-time job. And I'm still writing, I'm still creating copy for social media and strategies. So I still have writing involved. So uh, is it your out of the box thinking that makes you such a good social media manager? I think so, I think. Growing up with having a big imagination and trying different things that weren't usual um, really has helped me really think outside the box and really tap into my creativity. And I think that's why I really enjoy social media. So do you have to have someone check your copy? All or? the time. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so do you have like, uh, a teammate that checks your copy before you send it out? Yeah, I, I try to designate some people. And even when I'm um, writing um, articles, like I'm so lucky that I have a tribe that I can ask a few of my friends to proofread my stuff before I hand it into an editor. And I'm very lucky to have that. But I do have someone on my team who I'll reach out to to proofread any of my my stuff. Good. Um, so what do you feel like there's other areas of your life that your dyslexia has been either a positive or a negative for you? Um, I feel like sometimes it still can be a negative, like reading email. Sometimes I have to read it a few times because sometimes I just it just doesn't comprehend for me. And I'm like, I don't understand what this is. So another thing that I had to learn was tell people like, I get the email, but we might have to hop on a call and just talk it through because otherwise I'm not gonna understand what's happening. Um, so that's another thing that I had to teach myself and then make it known to my team that that's what I need sometimes. Or even when um, I'm going through uh, like a project, I might be like, I need you to, talk this out like I'm a five-year-old, just so it makes sense for me. Um, positive, I, I think, and also learning I had ADHD, I'm like, man, I wish I knew this when I was 10. It would have made school so much easier for me. Or what do you think you would have done differently? If I was medicated, I think I would have been able to focus more. Um, uh, it's just amazing how much I can like accomplish because my mind just drifts all over the place and it's hard for me to stay focused on one thing. Um, so I think that if I had it, I might've been able to complete um, projects 
earlier than like the last minute, which is something that I've just known to do is just wait until the final hour to chug out that essay or that studying of a test for the next day. So do you, are you medicated now? I am. Oh, okay. And so you find that to be helpful? Yeah, it's been really helpful. See, I've never, I mean, I'm definitely ADHD and I've never, um, I've never wanted to be medicated because of the, all the side effects that, or medicate my children either because of all the side effects. Do you have, do you experience side effects from it? I have not. I mean, I was nervous at first and I also was very confused because I, you know, they always associate it with like having, being hyper and I'm a, such a chill person that I thought like, that can't be right. Um, and the only reason why I figured out I had ADHD is because I thought like, oh, I must be depressed. That's why I can't get work done. But really, it's just that I had ADHD. I wasn't depressed. Oh, wow. Um, so, um, so, but yeah, it's been great to know that. And it was, it's helpful to know that I had dyslexia. It wasn't that I just didn't like reading. It was just I, I, I couldn't see it the way other people saw it. Right. And your mom's response to you is a very common response of teachers to students or parents. So many times they're like, you just need to read more to your kids. Well, you know, that's that's not going to do it. So. Yeah. Or they think you're lazy when really it's just it's really hard for you. And I yeah. think I wish that um, teachers would talk a little bit more about how that there's just different learnings for different kids. Did you know that New York City's mayor is dyslexic and he is putting all of New York City's teachers through um, a dyslexia training program? Oh, wow. That's incredible. Yeah. I just read that. And I was like, that is so awesome. Yeah. Uh, because um, my kids were diagnosed with dyslexia in Texas. and. Texas has been very proactive with dyslexia. And so my daughter's teacher knew almost immediately that she was dyslexic because she had been educated, probably like how the New York City teachers will be. And so she knew what it looks like. So, I mean, that little bit can make a difference in someone's life. I spent 12 years trying to figure out what was wrong with my daughter. And in one week, we had an answer. Wow. So, yeah. That's yeah, so that's that's pretty exciting how, I mean, doesn't benefit either of us, but lots of people will benefit from this moving forward. Yeah, like a lot of kids are not going to have the struggles that we had without knowing what we were, were struggling with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and my, my sister was a teacher in Westchester, and when I first started homeschool, homeschooling and tutoring my kids, she was like, dyslexia is not a real thing. Mm. So... I mean, you know, that's that's the knowledge that teachers had 12 years ago in New York City. And I wonder why she does she explain why she didn't believe dyslexia was a thing? I don't remember. I just, you know, I remember her saying that. And yeah. we're, we're not blood. She's my stepsister. So, you know, she doesn't have the gene yeah. um, that myself and my children have. So, yeah. But, you know, I mean, that's very common for people to just think that it was just some made up thing 10 years ago. Mm, so. Yeah. Well, and you probably were just graduating high school around then. Yeah, we could say that. <laughs> <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> so what advice do you have for parents of kids with dyslexia? Yeah, I think being patient. Um Similar to what my mom did was being proactive. If you have any resources that you can use, I know that like a lot of resources can be difficult when it comes to like finances and stuff like that. But I'm sure there's so many resources online today, which is what we didn't have when I was in school. Um, and, and having this podcast is great because they get to hear different stories and understand what their child is going through, which I think is really great. Um, so I think that's another way that they can learn and really just be their, their kids cheerleader. I think if my mom wasn't there for me and just 
put me on the wayside, I, I really don't know if I would have been able to graduate or have the confidence to actually apply to a four year school or, you know, go after my dreams of being a writer because I would have been so insecure about everything. And, um, and then something I didn't mention was that like, because I was so scared of um, public speaking, um, I didn't want to do anything like, like with the camera because I was so scared that I was gonna pronounce something wrong, see the word wrong. And so I didn't want to do it like TikTok or a YouTube thing. And um, I just randomly decided to make a TikTok. I needed to try TikTok because of my job, because I wanted to learn how to use it. Um, but it ended up being really successful. And it, even though I still have to tell my audience, like I have dyslexia and that's why sometimes I mispronounce things or I said the wrong word and I don't really need you to be in the comments telling me this. Like, I know. <laughs> that. That's great. Yeah. Well, and it's great that you have, um, have gone through your, um, see, I have trouble thinking of the words I want to say. And I am, I am doing um, Toastmasters to help me be more confident with my public speaking. Uh, but it's great that you surpassed your insecurities and took a deep dive into TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is fun but those comments can be vicious at times that sometimes you're just like oh i can't deal with this but you know it's great to, and i i made a TikTok talking about it and um so many people reached out and were like i have the same issues i'm so happy that you shared this and even after i wrote the article about my experience as a writer and being dyslexic i had so many people reach out and share their stories which just shows that sharing your stories really means a lot because other people resonate with it. Yeah. And that's where we are in this day and age is sharing instead of trying to hide it. Like our couple generations ago, people didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. So you said your mom um, isn't from here. Where, where's your mom from? Well, actually she is from here. She's the first generation. In oh, the okay. Um, but my grandparents are from, my grandma's from Jamaica and my grandfather's from Costa Rica, but ah. my dad is from Trinidad. So. Wow. So all over. All yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's all pretty much the islands, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's great. So do you have any recommendation for people of color um, of how to push through the lack of diagnoses and, and things that are existing. I know it's, it's hard and yeah, we don't get diagnosed as much as others, but I think if you keep trying to figure out um, what exactly is your issues and going to a doctor or trying to see if you can get an IEP, um, that's, that's really helpful. You just have to really advocate for yourself because sometimes they're just going to, overlook us to be honest it's really it's it's hard to admit it but it happens a lot and i think that's what happened with me so well yeah you know i mean i i was fortunate as a kid to get help early on but um my husband didn't have the same experience at all and you know my mother was a teacher and an advocate. So although I wasn't ever diagnosed with dyslexia, I mean, I self-diagnosed. So, you know, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I think people overlook a lot of it for everyone. But I think you're, what you're saying about being an advocate is, is probably one of the biggest things. And a lot of people of color may not feel as confident to stand up for their child's rights. Right. Yeah. And there are podcasts and websites that talk about black people and having learning disabilities. So there are resources and podcasts that can guide you with that as well. That's awesome. Like you said, podcasts are really, really helpful in getting information and, and making a difference in our lives and our children's lives. Yeah. Who would have thought? Right. <laughs> 
I know I never would have thought I'd have a podcast or a YouTube channel uh, two years ago, let alone <laughs> five years ago. And do you find it difficult ever or are you just like it's a, it's a breeze? <laughs> um, it's getting more comfortable. But um, I mean, like when I start off the interviews, I always seem to stumble. So I was actually thinking maybe we could re-record our start. <laughs> We can totally do that because I understand. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and lives, the same thing. I, I'm I'm quite nervous about doing lives. Um, and I just was in a coaching thing today and I said, how do you get over your fear? And they're like, you just have to do it. I'm like, okay, that wasn't really helpful. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but doing Toastmasters is great. I, I had, I did Toastmasters for a little bit and I was just thinking about how I should get back into it just to help me a little bit with presenting since it's so much a part of my career now. Well, maybe this was a sign to like push you to. It really <laughs> was baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Well, thank you for coming on our show today. I appreciate having you here and you being a part of it and sharing your, your life story about dyslexia with our listeners. Yes, thank you so much for having me and allowing me to share my story. And hopefully it helps at least one person. That's what I'm hoping. Yes, absolutely. Thank you.